Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Just uh, back to this uh, landmark speech by Ron Paul, March 2001 in the House of Representatives. <coughs> he said, <coughs> pardon me, nothing to fear from globalism, free trade, and a single world currency. So one world globalism, one world free trade, one, one world market, right? A single market for the world, one world market. One world globalism, one world market, and a one world gold commodity currency. Um, this means, of course, the, the destruction of the uh, of the nation states as we've known it. And he seems to match that up with the end of the traditional family, because the deregulation of marriage, of course, would roll back centuries of social progress, the status of women, status of children, property rights for women. You know, is it going to be I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, if some church says that? Will polygamy be allowed? Can the Mormons, uh, and some of them, come out from uh, under? Right? Will they have Warren Jepps all over the place? Uh, or maybe polyandry, right? Certain um, nirvana religions seem to uh, incline in that direction. Um, now, in this speech, the beginning of the end of fiat money, March 13, 2001, Ron Paul also tells you what are the barriers on the way to the world that he wants. And he says, quote, efforts to achieve peaceful globalist goals, and I think he means by that his goals, because that's what he's just said, efforts to achieve peaceful globalist goals are quickly abandoned when the standard of living drops, unemployment rises, stock markets crash, and artificially high wages are challenged by market forces. That seems to be saying the, the immediate effect of what I'm telling you is all that, all those bad things. When tight budgets threaten spending cuts, cries for expanding the welfare state drown out any expression of concern for rising deficits. So his, his political problem is, how do you apply the uh, extreme savage austerity of uh, Austrianism uh, under conditions of, uh, of democratic rule. Well, it seems to be the, the practical answer he's found is to organize a movement of people who are uh, essentially duped and who then want to, uh, they're calling for their own throats to be cut, in effect. A lot of people were duped by Obama, 2008, and I'm afraid a lot of them are getting duped uh, this time around. And I'm telling you this because I was able to call that in 2008. I know what I'm talking about. Take this seriously. Don't just write it off. Uh, I knew what I was talking about then, and I know what I'm talking about now. Uh, we're told that the crash of 1921 is a model for our future, more or less what we've just heard. Uh, of course, the crash of 1921 was not that long in the United States because we had a healthy uh, industrial base, which we do not have in this uh, junk heap of a post-industrial economy today. But in the 1920s, it was the crash of 1921 that sent British unemployment up into the millions, and it never came down until World War II. And look a little bit further. How about Italy? What's the effect of the crash of 1921 in Italy? Well, crash of 1921 is followed in 1922 by Mussolini's March on Rome, October 1922. Is there a connection? I think there is. The crisis got worse, and that set the stage for a fascist seizure of power. Um, I'm told that if you, if you oppose Ron Paul because of his austerity plans, and let, let me also cite this, some of this comes from uh, an article by uh, Paul Craig Roberts, who has had certain uh, merits, of course, in, uh, in anti-war and 9-11 questions. But now he says, America's last chance, and America's last chance, according to him, is Ron Paul. He says uh, a number of things about it, but one of, the, one of the things he and others have suggested is if you oppose Ron Paul because of the savage austerity, you're saying that American lives are more important than, than the black and brown or yellow people of the, uh, of the impoverished third world. No. Um, let's take U.S. Department of Agriculture Food for Peace. Remember, emergency food aid on this planet, 57% of this comes from the U.S. With all the flaws, I don't care. This tends to put some kind of a floor under the world famine situation. Ron Paul wipes out food for peace. It goes to zero. At this point, 57% of the existing food aid in the world ceases to exist. And I say to you, that means millions of deaths, more than those killed by Bush and Obama. And all of their efforts, because economic genocide, as Robert McNamara, going from the Pentagon to the World Bank, proved you can kill more with famine and malnutrition than you can kill with bombs. By far, there is no comparison. So uh, I don't want to hear that uh, nonsense either. 
Um, we're told here, uh, Paul Craig Roberts says, only Ron Paul respects the U.S. Constitution and its protection of civil liberty. Well, let's take a look at that. I think it's baloney. Uh, Ron Paul, I see as in conflict with the U.S. Constitution. The General Welfare Clause appears twice in the preamble and in the specific responsibility of Congress. What does the General Welfare Clause mean to Ron Paul? Nothing, as far as I can see. The Constitution says that the Congress has the right to borrow money. Ron Paul says, no, the Austrians know better. That the Congress has the ability to regulate money. Well, we've heard no, because that's going to be a gold currency that's going to be beyond the reach of any government. The uh, Congress has the right to impose tariffs, according to the 18 uh, enumerated powers. No, says Ron Paul. And of course, the elastic clause, the necessary and proper, goes out the window. The 14th Amendment, the no state shall deprive anybody of the equal protection of the laws. Ron Paul says no. His, news, his newsletter, the most recent uh, things are in his newsletter, say that if you're a black teenager at the age of 13, you should be tried as an adult. The implication is that white teenagers of 13 are younger and shouldn't be tried as adults. So there's no equal protection of the laws. There's certainly no ability of the president and the 14th Amendment to make good on the public debt, overriding uh, congressional obstructionism. He doesn't like the 17th Amendment, the direct election of senators. That's not oligarchical enough. So this is the program of plutocracy. And again, the secessionism we've mentioned, um, states' rights. This reminds me of the fugitive slave law. Remember that in the 1850s, the Kansas-Nebraska Compromise said that if a slave flees to Massachusetts, they've got to send them back. Massachusetts replied by passing a personal liberty law to block that. What did the slaveocrats, what did the slave power conspiracy say at that point? They said, down with Massachusetts, we're overriding the states' right of Massachusetts. The point was not states' rights. The point was the state's right to impose slavery, or better yet, just slavery. And today, we're told it's great to have the ability of states to, uh, to choose to be uh, unionized, right? non-right to work. But if they can, Ron and Rand, and, most, and just about all the Republicans, uh, even Santorum now, has come around to say, it's time to impose this... Uh, this uh, national right-to-work law. So they're going to ride roughshod over what New York or Illinois or California or Massachusetts want. When it comes to union busting now or slavery yesterday, states' rights go out the window in the first minute. So this pure, pure demagogy, and it's not, uh, it's not encouraging. Uh, the racial element is unavoidable. Um, the, uh, we have a very interesting quote from uh, Hubert Humphrey. I've got this in Obama, the Postmodern Coup, page 196. Uh, Hubert Humphrey said in 1976, candidates who make an attack on Washington are making an attack on government programs, on blacks, on minorities, on the cities. It's a disguised new form of racism, a disguised new form of conservatism, again, reactionary. This is, and then I write in, uh, four years ago, this is, of course, a good diagnosis of the monetarist freedom, Friedmanite demagogy of Ronald Reagan in 1980 or of Ron Paul today. But it was pioneered before Reagan by Carter. Yes, so this is the oligarchy, the plutocracy in general. Um, the Mormons, uh, this, again, this convergence that we see uh, between Ron Paul and, and Romney, what is it? that the presence of Ron Paul locks up up to now maybe 20, 22 percent of the Republican votes, which would otherwise be divided among some opponent of Romney. So in a sense, he takes about one-fifth of the Republican votes and puts him in the deep freeze so that Romney can then hope to get a larger proportion of the others. You saw Ron Paul defending Romney on the Bain asset-stripping issues, and you see him in the debates. He's attacking Santorum. Sometimes he attacks Gingrich as a serial uh, hypocrite or whatever it is doesn't attack Romney. How come Ron Paul doesn't attack Romney? Because Romney's out there saying, we have to be so strong that nobody will dare attack us. We need 100,000 more troops uh, and so forth. Um, take a look at the Lucy Commissar blog, and you will see stuff about Romney, not even at Bain, but as a member of the Marriott board. So, uh, again, we went through the deregulation of marriage. Um... So uh, Romney needs all the help he can get. He's a brittle candidate. Hunt Huntsman is now dropped out in favor of his cousin Mitt. And again, Ron Paul seems to be serving as a uh, 
as a kind of uh, hidden auxiliary of the Romney campaign. And Romney is the biggest warmonger. So if you really think that, that Ron Paul is the key to peace, he's the authentic peace angel, why doesn't he attack Romney directly and personally as a warmonger? And I don't see it happening. So we'll be back with you again next week, God willing.